We are live. So hello, everyone. My name is Seth Shapiro, and I am your presenter today. I am a, a consultant with Admission Auto, which is a premier admissions consulting and counseling company. We work with MBA candidates the world over. Um, we've been doing this for many, many years. And one of the schools that we focus on is Stanford, the Stanford Graduate School of Business, which is obviously one of the focus areas for today. So it is my pleasure to be presenting to you. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, I will be presenting for, let's say, the next 20, 25 minutes uh, up to some slides that we have prepared about how one might approach their interview, what they need to know, sort of the nuts and bolts of the entire process. And then I will take questions um, from anyone who submits them. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, I suggest you type them into the chat box. I will try to take them in the order in which they are received. And if possible, try and keep them as, I wouldn't say generic as possible, but recognize that this is a broad audience. So try not to be too specific to your background. This idea is not to be a counseling session or a one-on-one -on -one consulting session, but rather an informative presentation for everyone. Um, we also just, and I will probably mention this as a plug later in the presentation, we will, uh, we are always happy as a firm to engage with you. If you're thinking of applying in the fall or in, in future years, uh, right now we're actually offering our early bird discounts uh, for people who sign up for packages geared towards the 2022-2023 season. So that might be something if you're serious about applying, especially to schools like Stanford, to take advantage of early on. So that's my plug, shameless as it may be, but now let's get into the presentation. So as I mentioned, this interview or this presentation is really all about um, the interview process with a slight focus on Stanford GSB. As I will note throughout the presentation and in the question, Stanford, uh, the Stanford interview is actually not all that uh, different or unique in a lot of ways. It's somewhat standard um, compared to a couple of their peer institutions. So everything pretty much I, or pretty much everything that I will present applies to Stanford with a few tweaks here and there. Great, so let us first talk about how, or the difference between business school interviews and job interviews. A, many of you have held at least one job at, up until this point, or you're, you're interviewing for jobs, say if you're in school right now, or you've had multiple job interviews because you've switched jobs since graduating from, from college, that's great, that's good experience. But the business school interview is fundamentally different from a job interview. A job interview, may touch upon some personal things, but for the most part, it's going to be very focused on your professional experience, what you've done in, say, a previous role that might be relevant to what it is you're trying to achieve or get out of the next job that you're interviewing for. Business school interviews are a little bit more holistic in nature. They want to know more about your life story, which obviously professional experience is a, a big part of, but they will talk about things like your, your college experience, um, your, your upbringing, uh, interesting side bits that have frankly nothing to do with the job itself, but it's a great way for these business school admissions committee members to get to know who you are and the type of person um, you will be after you graduate from their programs. So to that point, um, the second bullet on this slide here is really talking about sort of your technical and job specific competencies. That's all great. But that's not going to be like, again, the main focus. You may speak to some of those skills in the interview itself, certainly if they're prompted by your interviewer, but that's not going to be the driving force. You know, things like, can you put together a model or can you put together uh, a pricing strategy or can you build a marketing uh, a marketing plan? Those are all helpful, but they have to be woven into the context of, 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 well, what kind of person does this make me? Um, how will I be a leader? How will I be a professional after that? It's just one component of it, but it's evidence to support you in that. And the other thing to keep in mind is unlike for job interviews where 
the candidate pool may be people from certain backgrounds. Let's just say you're interviewing for a private equity role. You might be, they might be interviewing from uh, candidates who are or investment bankers or possibly even management consultants. That is different from this process where an interviewer who is usually might be an alumnus or an admissions committee member is going to be pulling from a wide variety of folks. They might talk about people from, as is noted here, the Peace Corps, uh, people who are coming from private equity, people who are coming from a nonprofits in India or the military in South America. I mean, there is a wide variety. So it's important to keep your frame of mind around, again, who you are, your future impact, your leadership potential, and not so much drilled into your industry, unless, again, the interview goes in that direction. So there are really two major components to any interview. Um, and as you can see, based on the percentages that we've indicated here, um, it's really about you. It's all about massing your narrative. That, are, that is 90% of what this, this interview is really about. And what we mean by your narrative is where have you come to date and where are you going? And obviously in that second part about where are you going, where does the MBA fit into that? This interview is really about getting to know you as a person getting to know your story, getting to know your trajectory, the ups and downs, the zigs, the zags, and so forth, right? And so so you really need to uh, make sure that story is very tight, that you understand exactly how to tell it in a succinct way, but in an impactful way nonetheless. The second part, which is, we believe, much more minor in nature is, well, why do you want to go to this program? All these admissions committee members realize that you are applying most likely to a handful of programs. Even if you're applying to Stanford, um, most likely you're also applying to Harvard and Wharton. That tends to be the three, maybe through Columbia, MIT, Northwestern, and so forth in the, the batch. Uh, those tend to be obviously part of the M7 schools that people often refer to. But the point here is that you're going to try and have some choices. And, and no one can rely on any one given school for a guaranteed admission. And so while the schools want to see that you have a demonstrated interest in their program, they recognize that it's really more about who you are and that if you end up getting into their program, it's then their job to sell you on why you should attend and matriculate. So that's just something um, worth noting. Again, your interview may go in a different direction. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but they may talk about why you like this program. They, the interviewer may want to tease that out, but really the focus is very heavily on, on your narrative. So we like, and this is not unique to Admission Auto by any means, we like the STAR framework standing for situation, task, action, and results. We think that this is a very complete way to answer um, not every single interview question, but most, especially where one uh, insinuates that you need to bring information to bear as in the form of an anecdote or an example. So let me go through this quickly, um, but again, it should be something that's fairly well known to most of you. So the first S is situation. Uh, this is all about contextualizing uh, the exact circumstances in which you were involved. So let's just say you uh, had to build a presentation for the CEO and you didn't have the information and you were under a tight timeline, right? You guys get your interviewer up to speed very quickly. Make sure you give them only the information that they need to know, not all this other, all this other data and things that would be nice to know if you had more time, um, but, but obviously don't in this situation. So get up to speed very quickly and just make it seem like if they knew nothing about the situation, they then were up to speed in a matter of you know, 10, 15, even 20 seconds, depending on the complexity. Task and action kind of go hand in hand, but basically task was like, okay, well, what, 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 are you, what were you trying to do in this situation? What was the goal, right? What, what, what was the challenge that you faced? Uh, make sure that that could tie to situation as well, but make sure that's very front and center so the interviewer can understand what exactly is presented, uh, was presented to you. Action. This is very critical. This is probably the most important part of the of the four components, but it is what did you do? It is all about your contribution. What did you lead? Uh, you know, what alternatives did you consider uh, to that action? This is all about how you demonstrate your leadership and your decision making in a particular moment. Um, you know, it's nice to say, oh, we had a presentation to give to the CEO and 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 then maybe you go on from there and say, well, and then it happened and so forth. That's not great. That's not really showing anything. That's just basically describing a situation that you were involved in. If you were talking about action even more clearly, you would say, you know, my role on the team was to 
organize all of the individual team members to, to streamline the information, to actually deliver the presentation or so forth, whatever the situation might be. But this is, again, your bread and butter. This is where you show who you are as a leader and how you're able to influence a situation, hopefully to the positive impact. Finally, the results. This is a little bit less important. Actually, you, most people think that that's really critical. Um, it's, again, sort of kind of rounding out this, this uh, framework and almost um, almost uh, creating a barbell in a way. It's, it's what what ended up happening, right? What was the outcome? Um, it's not necessarily important that like this was the most impressive presentation you ever give. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But the point is, is it sort of finishes the story. It gives it gives the interviewer the option to say, okay, based on my results or based on my actions and based on the situation I was presented with, here's how I deliver it. And it's a nice way to kind of to kind of close out your story. So when you're thinking about the this framework, make sure you kind of go through in your, your mind. You don't have to say this was the situation, this was a task. Don't be that deliberate, but just make sure this is done in a very structured but but uh, fluid way. So when you think about any of the questions that you're getting, especially the common ones, and there there can be a multitude of questions that fall under this category, uh, you do want to sort of, I think, practice. Now, this is the, what we call the note card method. You don't have to also do this. Some people like to be more off the cuff. Some people like to be more scripted. I personally think that a hybrid of the two is, is your best bet, where you've done some practice, you've kind of thought through answers that you're most likely or questions you're most likely to receive but at the same time you're not incredibly scripted so you don't sound as our icon indicates here robotic in any way um, you want to just make sure that you have your talking points in mind so that if you get a question that you might have expected or maybe didn't expect but um but you know is in the the realm of possibilities that you weren't thrown off these are this interview is even if it, it may be not doesn't count nearly as much as it has in the past. It is still a high pressured situation. The stakes are there. And so you want to, you might in that moment forget a point or you might get nervous or the tension might kind of show through. That's okay, right? That's very natural. But doing all this prep work in advance in the form of the note card method or whatever other uh, uh, practice you like to employ is, is good just so that you have that information fresh in your mind, even if you're, you're, you're fishing through what exactly it is that you want to say. And, and I think it's important, you may want to think about these answers as it relates to the STAR method, right, or the STAR framework. I think that can be helpful as well just to kind of give you, give you some ideas. So there's a little bit of prep that that you can do for these interviews. Uh, you don't, again, as I mentioned, want to be overly prepared. Part of what makes, I think, an interview successful, be it a professional one or a business school interview, is, is being prepared, but also sort of going with the flow, right? Going with your gut, letting your personality and what makes you successful shine through. Um, you can only anticipate so many questions. There's so many different ways it'll go. A lot of it is geared or is based on what the interview um, interviewer wants to do, right? They, the expression or the common expression is, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So do the part where you work hard, but hopefully that means you also get lucky too. And so these are just a few ideas that we've thrown out there that we think um, can be very successful. So one is your interviewer identity. So you're going to know um, in advance uh, who your interviewer is. This person who might be an admissions committee member, but more likely in the case of Stanford B, an uh, alumnus, um, is going to reach out to you. They're going to uh, introduce themselves. You'll have their name. Maybe you'll have a little bit of information about them. Certainly their 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 ge geographic location. And so you can most likely do some some general desktop research, as we call it, to understand who they are. So that could be looking them up on LinkedIn, doing a general Google search, anything where you can get a little bit of information uh, about you know their career, maybe when they went to to business school, in this case, Stanford. Um, don't go to the point of being a stalker. <laughs> That's not the goal here. You don't want to bring up personal instances that are clearly not relevant to the interview itself. But I think just having some context will allow you to better inform maybe your questions or, or even just frankly relax your nerves as far as the type of person that um, is engaging with you. Sometimes schools, and this is not really the case with Stanford, um, will provide some prompts. Um, they might say, here are topics that you could discuss. Maybe the interviewer will even say that in their email to you. That's great. If that is the case, obviously you want to be able to prepare for that content. But um, but if not, like 
we can certainly talk about this in the session or, or certainly if you engage with us for interview prep at Admission Auto, um, there are general uh, buckets of categories or, or, or subjects that, that usually are covered in these interviews. And so it's just good to be able to know um, what these prompts might be and how you might respond to them. And then finally, uh, school specific resources can be helpful as well. So if you know you're interviewing at Stanford, there's obviously a wealth of information out there, whether that be uh, that you can research. So if there are interesting classes or conferences or treks or special offerings or what have you um, that that are interesting to you and think tie into your narrative and your candidacy, you should obviously research them. You should note them, even though, as I mentioned, it's only 10 percent of what we think is is counted in terms of this interview. You still want to ace that 10 percent. And and so you should be well prepared to answer well, why Stanford, uh, you know, and, and specifically what examples can you show to prove that? Um, so so make sure that you you're using that. Plus, you can obviously pull information from your application. Stanford is what's called um, a blind interview, which means your interviewer um, pretty much does not know much about you. They have not read your application essays. They have not read your recommendation letters. They just have most likely your resume, uh, a little bit of information about you beyond that. Um, but otherwise, you need to be introducing a lot of that information. So the Stanford GSB questions have been a lot about, well, why Stanford and, and so forth. And so you can bring in a lot of that information, but you should still always have uh, additional information beyond what you've written in your essays uh, to bear or bring that to bear. This is another question that we or topic that we get a lot about, which is international experience. It comes up not as often as people think it does, and it's not nearly quite the requisite that it used to be in the past, or, or at least certainly the way I believe it to be. So the, the belief is that a lot of business schools want to see candidates who have some sort of international exposure. Um, and not everyone does. Some have more than others. Um, this can take many different forms. So what I would say is if it if international or something international comes up or it is a big part of your background, you should introduce it, but don't necessarily force feed it. So we have put out three points here that can help people think creatively about ways they are international in some respect. So the first one is if you worked abroad or travel abroad, that could be an interesting experience that you might want to talk about in terms of what you learned about another country um, from a leisure or professional standpoint. Uh, Maybe you didn't actually, second point is maybe you didn't actually work abroad, um, but you did engage with teams that were abroad. So you work for a, a multinational company. And even if, say, you were based in in in, uh, in, in France, but you had a, a team in Germany and a team in India, right, you can talk about how you liaised with them and what sort of barriers you had to overcome to kind of make that happen or whatever project you were engaged in, that can be interesting. Um, and then the third point is just more about the fact that it doesn't have to necessarily be professional experience, international experience. It can be about maybe you served in the military overseas. Um, as I mentioned, you studied abroad, uh, you did some sort of fluency or some sort of um, a service work, or you have foreign language fluency. I mean, any of these sorts of things can, can be interesting. But again, I wouldn't put a huge uh, emphasis on this. I think it's just something that we often get a lot, so we like to preempt it in this presentation, but uh, just something worth noting. And, and Stanford GSP does not um, require this by any means. It's just something that we want to, to address. Every interview, no matter which school it is, um, is going to at least afford you a, a few minutes for questions. Um, the, a lot of this depends on, on, or the types of questions you want to ask depend on who your interviewer is. So in the case, let's just say it is Stanford GSB and it's almost always going to be an alum, alumnus interview. You may get an admissions committee member, but it's rare. Um, you want to think about, well, what is that person, in what position is that person um, and what will they be able to answer? So if you were asking a student, right, some, some schools have second year students who, who conduct interviews. Uh, you might want to ask them about their current experience, about uh, you know where they might be heading after school, you know things that are very real in the moment. Whereas if you're talking to an alumnus and they've graduated, you know, ten plus years from from the school, they may not be as plugged into what's going on in the day to day of the GSB experience, but they could be 
very aware of like what it means to be an alumnus and and how you stay connected to the school or even what they did experience back then. So um, and the same thing goes for an, uh, an admissions committee member. If they were not an alumnus of the school, you know, you might want to ask questions about the program, about resources that are available, things that 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 they would be especially qualified to answer. But regardless of who your interviewer is, you do need to be prepared to have several questions. I don't know the exact number because it depends. If it's an hour interview, <clears throat> that might mean 15 minutes a question. If it's 45 minutes, sometimes it's 10. If it's 30, it's five. I mean, you can see proportionally how that works out. But the point is, is that you need to have ample material so that you can speak for whatever amount of period of time that you are given until the interview ends. Um, that could be three questions. That could be 10. Um, I always say prepare more, even if you use less. Uh, and one other thing to note is what a good question tends to consist of is introducing effectively uh, three points, right? The first is uh, intro researching something specific about the school. So talking about maybe a program or a class or a resource that you read about um, related to the school. Then potentially bringing yourself back into the question by connecting that point to something in your background uh, that you either discussed in the interview or perhaps didn't but want to introduce at that point in time. And then turning the, the question to the interviewer to say, well, you know, what do you think or can you extrapolate or, or basically giving them an open ended way to respond to that. That is a great question. Not every question is going to fit that, but it is better than certainly talking to an alumnus and asking them, well, how did you like your experience or what was something that really surprised you? Those are throwaway questions. If you really are desperate and want to run out the interview, that's great. You can use those, but that's not the sort of question that's going to win them over. And the other thing, too, to note is that this is sort of your last impression that you're going to be able to leave with your interviewer. Now, while a lot of people think that the questions you ask probably don't matter as much. No one really writes them down in their write-ups. Uh, it is still part of the holistic evaluation. So you really want to leave a lasting impression. And if you are excited about a school like Stanford GSB, which is ultra competitive, you don't really want to take any chances and, and ask bland questions just to fill time. So we are still operating in a pandemic and, and these interviews right now are, are still virtual. And I, I, I happen to be of the belief that they might be for the indefinite future because it actually is a more efficient way to conduct these interviews and frankly, a little safer too, just given that you are might be meeting a stranger in person. So that's just something to note. But there are a few tactics that we like to uh, suggest uh, to improve your appearance for the virtual interview. So, uh, one you want to do is just make sure your environment is is appropriate where you control that so that has everything to do from the lighting to the sound um you know make sure that like you've tested your internet multiple times look yeah, things happen internet goes out you know connections get disrupted you can't control that entirely but to the extent you can minimize those errors you must do that right make sure that for example your background your lighting is appropriate that you've tested this this um, program that usually the interviewers or the uh, the schools will send some sort of uh, a program right or, or, or platform that they use if you have the ability to test it do that if it's zoom test it on your own obviously you want to look professional in nature for the most part I, I believe you want to wear a suit uh, it's not again a professional interview in the traditional sense but I think that's the default unless you believe that or you hear from your interviewer that they're asking you to dress more casually just so that frankly they feel more comfortable but i think a suit is appropriate certainly nothing less than if you're a guy uh a collared shirt and if, if you are wearing just a collared shirt without a tie make sure it's crisp make sure the color is appropriate so that it um it doesn't clash with the background i mean again all the sorts of things you would normally do if you're going to an in-person interview just thinking about it in a virtual capacity um and then this last point is um about glasses i'm obviously not interviewing so i don't really care i need these to see <laughs> but but if you do have glasses and they don't have some sort of anti-glare uh coating you want to make sure that that they look appropriate and they don't they don't create sort of like a a, a, a translucency um, between you know your eyes on the screen so um so just you know again exercise good judgment one of the things that we really like to note is while it is nice to have um, and an advantage in a virtual interview to have notes nearby you i would say keep them really brief that's not you know 
no, having notes is not illegal. It is not a faux pas, but you don't want to be reading down. You want to be looking. If you want to have some post-its around the screens behind you to, to remind you of things like, you know, speak slowly, speak loudly, have fun, smile, you know, encouragements like that. That's great. Uh, but don't have like your script written down because it's very hard to read that and it might become readily apparent if you're trying to recite something from paper. So keep that in mind. The, the last point here that I will mention is just that interviewers like to talk about themselves. Um, this is probably a good uh, piece of advice for interviews in general, but certainly for, uh, for the MBA interviews, which is um, folks like to, to hear themselves talk. It's just a human nature. Uh, and so, you know, if you, you don't necessarily need to go on and on in, as a response to each question, make sure you're answering the questions appropriately, comprehensively, um, and so forth, but you know, less is more. If they want more information, they'll ask you, right? They're not say that I'm not saying that every question is going to be one, 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 kind of in a sequential, non-responsive way. The questions might be, well, tell me about a time when you led a project and you give a response and then you said something interesting and the interviewer wants to follow up. Great, let them follow up, right? Try and keep your answers to, in some cases, 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, keep it brief um, so that, you know, you're giving them exactly what they need to know. It's memorable. It's digestible. And, and then they can continue to engage after that. So um, and the reason being is uh, these interviews are not terribly long. Some of them are 30 minutes. Some of them are up to an hour. It goes by pretty quickly. I mean, I've been talking for almost 30 minutes and it feels like it's been two. <laughs> um, but the point is also is that business school um, and even in general is all about sort of the socialization. Business school is a professional or getting an MBA is a professional experience and that you're earning a degree focused on, on business or management. Um, but it is always about sort of forming those relationships, um, uh, socializing with people with whom you'll know for a long period of time. And so. The point is, is you want to come off personable for a lot of consultants, as they say, you want to pass the airline test or the plane test or whatever it is where, you know, can you spend a, an extended period of time with this person on a range of topics? And so that's kind of what you're trying to demonstrate here. OK, so I think that's basically it. Um, I'm done with the presentation here. Uh, I will be happy to take questions. As I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, we are uh, at Admission Auto always doing it. We do two, We offer two things. We offer interview prep in two forms, a standard and then like a deluxe package. Um, both uh, include a mock interview and a general information prep session. And then the deluxe or the premium, I think it's called, gives you a second mock. So it's something you might want to consider, especially if you're looking at some of these elite schools. Okay, great. So um, we have a question here. It says, school has asked to finish interview within seven days, but I asked more time due to personal reasons. Is it good to ask the school to extend the timeline? Definitely. Uh, these schools are, you know, they, they like to run fairly rigid processes, but uh, because they're obviously operating on short timelines and they have a lot of material as in applications to go through, definitely um, uh, ask for an extended timeline. These are still people. So just explain why you're asking for it if it's not deeply personal, and I'm sure they will grant it to you. We have a question about how many Indians receive interview invites and what is their conversion rate? I have no idea. I'm sorry. Um, and I don't think that information is going to be public. So um, I don't think that also really should impact uh, how you perform or your approach. But um, I'm sorry. I can't, can't respond to that. The question is, do you have any doc or document of what entries interviewers fill out about candidates post-interview? Uh, I do not. Um, I but, but you can imagine it's basically going to be things. I mean, we have general information about it. Uh, they're going to want to know, you know, about the, the student or the candidate's style, um, whether what they talked about uh, broadly, what examples they used. Did they show an interest in the school? Uh, how did they do that? Um, you know, where they, do you think that they would engage effectively if they were a student on campus? Just trying to get out general data points about the type of person, how they handled themselves, and whether they would fit. The question is, when it comes to MBA interviews between two on-par candidates, what do you think is the deal breaker for the final decision? 
I, I'm not sure. I think it just comes down to fit. If you're talking about, if you're assuming two on par candidates, meaning like their written applications are similar, which is virtually impossible, right? For that to be, it's still very individualized and subjective for that matter. As far as the deal breaker or the interview is concerned, I think it's it comes down to, you know, did this person, will this person fit? You know, did this person feel like a Stanford GSB candidate? If the, if the um, interviewers are all alumni, which they tend to be, they're, they know the culture of the school. And so they're going to say, I think at the end of the day, this person would be much more successful here and would have a greater impact on campus. I realize that is a little bit of a, a generic answer. It's not actionable, but the question is a little bit challenging. I heard that GSB interview involves so many follow-up questions. Can you explain it more? So effectively what that means is kind of what I talked about when at the end where you want your interviewer to ask you follow-up questions. So what they might do is they might be probing in almost a Socratic method type of fashion. So they might ask you about, ex going back to what I said, an example of a time when you uh, – demonstrated leadership and you'll respond about that example using the star framework and then they might ask about a particular detail so let's just say you, you were presenting to the ceo in a short timeline and you gave your response about what it took to get the information pull together the presentation coordinate with the team and so forth they then might ask you about dynamics uh, related to the team if there were any challenges then you might say well there was a challenge with one teammate who wasn't you know shouldering their part of the uh, of the project and then uh, and then they might ask well why and how did you deal with that and then they that you might say this is the tactics I used and then and then they might ask you know well how did that affect your relationship uh, moving forward and so you got to respond to that and so the idea is they want to see uh, they want to tease out if this was a real story um, if this was a, a real uh, impactful story and and how you might even respond, frankly, in a classroom setting or a professional setting where you're asked multiple follow-up questions um, about a particular moment or a piece of information. So this question is, I know the interview is virtual. Is it good to request from the interviewer for an in-person interview? I don't think you will be granted that, so do not request it. This is the format that the school takes. Um, it is it is pandemic friendly and you are not going to be given uh, this option just because you asked for it. What should an applicant work on for the interview to maximize their chances of being accepted? What is the ideal stand for G GSB MBA candidate? So the entire presentation was all about what you can work on to maximize your chances of being accepted. I think the just to recap is to go over um, your 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 biggest and best stories. So maybe have your four to five uh, most impactful moments. Um, they could be personal, they could be professional, they could be both to the extent there's overlap. Uh, make sure you run through those stories that you understand the nuances of them so that you can use them to answer multiple questions. Sometimes what I like to do is for my camp, my clients is come up with a matrix where on one axis you have um, key uh, attributes uh, or characteristics of who you are. So that might be a uh, good communicator, great speaker, um, grace under pressure, technical ability or what have you, right? It can be 10, whatever number you want to put down there. And then the other side, you put uh, major stories or, or, or anecdotes you want to use and then so that could be presentations to the ceo that could be volunteering at service organization that could be um, helping with recruiting and then think about the matrix and then check off or x where there's overlap so that you have a visual presentation of which stories apply to which types of, of characteristics and which types of questions might be asked that can be a helpful framework. Some people like the note card method where they look at the most common types of questions and they jot down the types of answers they might give. It's a very personal way to approach it, so it's really your call. And then as far as the ideal stand for GSB MBA candidates concerned, there there really isn't any. I don't think that, um, I mean, people talk about the, the nuances of different schools. And for example, Kellogg is very marketing friendly and, and personable and HBS is all about leadership and GSB is all about entrepreneurship and creativity. I think those are, are nice uh, high level uh, 
reputations, but if you look at the GSB classes year over year, they're going to have people from finance, from from uh, from entrepreneurial backgrounds, from consulting, from you know uh, corporate America or what have you. So there really isn't a specific characteristic. I think what does uh, what all GSB candidates share is the fact that they're extremely smart, they're very ambitious. Um, they're very engaged, um, and they have a love for being there. The people at GSB really, really are excited to be there. So I, I know that's not probably the answer you want to get, but I don't know if anyone could give you a specific ideal candidate, because if it was, everyone would try and fit that mold, and that's clearly not their process. The question is, how much does the interview matter for GSB admissions, maybe in terms of percentage of the overall application? You're definitely never going to get an answer about the percentage. Every every uh, every application um, is reviewed with their own criteria, and, and and the schools don't announce it. And they're also that rigid, where they're like, "Well, candidates scored nine per, you know, uh, you know, a high a ten out of ten on the interview, which is ten percent. That's not the case, or at least I'm not aware of it." Um, let me put it this way. The interview is another data point for them to consider. Bearing in mind, it is arguably the most subjective component of your application because the admission, unlike HBS or NYU, which are non-blind um, and the admission or the interviews are non-blind are done by the admissions committee members, GSB is done by alumni for the most part. And so each alumnus is going to run their interviews in the way they like to. And so it's very hard to calibrate across all of the various interviewers and maybe in terms of their style and their, their own evaluation method. I mean, you could have one interviewer who is particularly harsh and, and has a high bar for people getting in and another interviewer who loves everybody. So it's, it's very hard to factor that in. I think the point I mentioned is for the most part, you'd like to fall in a, in a healthy band of people who, let's say in, in the middle 80%, right? 10% of people on the bottom who are just downright awful, right? They come off as arrogant. They don't speak English well, um, which is obviously a requisite for attending the program. They they um, are unprepared. They were late. I mean, there's a lot of interview faux pas you can probably imagine happen that would, would, would keep someone out. And then there might be, on the other side of the gamut, 10% uh, of candidates who are exceptional. Um, that tends to be less the case, in my opinion, where like an interview wins you over, but you never know. Maybe there was a really, uh, a really heartfelt moment. I, I, I don't see it as often, but it's possible. But I'd say in most part, people are pretty prepared coming in. Um, you answer the questions well, and people make a recommendation, say this is a great student or this is a great candidate and so forth. And so I'd say take it seriously, but it's not, it's not a gateway. It's not like um, if you got the interview and you did well, you're necessarily going to get in. It is just one more consideration as part of the overall evaluation of your profile. This question reads, once you get to the interview process, does that always mean the program is genuinely interested in you? Or do you believe a program may have the decision made prior to the interview? So it actually follows very nicely from my previous response. So I think that the answer to the first question is yes, the program is interested in you or they're interested in you in enough where like you check a lot of the boxes for admission. They're not going to waste their time or the interviewer's time um, interviewing someone who had a GMAT score, for example, that was subpar for what they would accept. That would just not be right. They would filter people out on that. But what they're effectively saying is, OK, this is an interested candidate. We think it's worth it for everyone's time to speak to them. We're going to take that interview into consideration as a data point, as I mentioned, but it doesn't mean that if they did super well, that that guarantees admission. And I don't believe that the decision is pre-made. I do think for some people, some some very uh, few number of like uh, uh, exceptional candidates, um, the decision might be more, This the interview might be more confirmatory. Um, you can probably guess some of the profiles of people who fit that, uh, fit that, fit that um, description, but uh, for the most part, a lot of times they'll do, the schools might do a preliminary review of your background to get the interview requests out there, then wait for the interview to happen and then factor that into a second evaluation of your profile. So it's all still dynamic. I would not go into this assuming you got it in the bag or it's useless. It is still very, very dynamic and relevant to your candidacy. The, the question is, is it good to send thank you notes to admissions committee members post-interview? 
Of course, then thank you to, oh, okay, the admissions committee. No, you should absolutely not. That looks very aggressive um, and, and gratuitous. Uh, but yes, to the interviewer for sure. Um, and that's a good point, actually. I did not talk about this. Uh, it is just nice form, um, just a, a courteous thing to to uh, uh, send a note thanking them for their time. Um, this is obviously something they do voluntarily. They These interviewers do it because they enjoy, assuming they're alumni, they, they feel very connected to the school. They want to help out. And so it is just proper to do that. Uh, don't go over the top. Um, you want to keep it short and sweet. You want to effectively thank them for their time. Talk about one or two things that were interesting that you talked about uh, that maybe you learned in, in discussing excuse me, with them. And then, um, you know, some sort of salutation. Um, about the process and so forth. Um, make sure there are no typos, that you use the right school. Don't thank them for interviewing you for HBS when it was actually a GSB interview. I mean, basic things like that. Um, but you absolutely want to send a note, usually within 24 hours. I mean, sometimes if it's a morning interview, it's appropriate to send it later in the day. Or if it's an evening interview, you could do it the next day. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to change. It's not As long as you don't make any mistakes, it's not going to influence your, your performance. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's good for him. And I would definitely not inter uh, email the admissions committee. You're not going to score any brownie points by doing that. So the question, this is a good question, actually, which is how do you answer why GSB uh, without sounding generic? It is very tough because, as you can probably imagine, you <laughs> everyone has heard, uh, all alumni and, and, and all the admissions committee folks have heard, you know, why, why GSB? Uh, responses to that. And so you don't want to talk about things like, well, I like the fact that it's in you know the Bay Area or Palo Alto, that um, you know it has great entrepreneurial resources, the classes are geared for so and so. Yeah, that's all nice. But what the key is to tie it to who you are um, and make it a personal response. So you do want to have, I would say, three reasons. I feel like that's always appropriate. Two feels short, four feels like overkill. So you mentioned the reason about something that's GSP specific, and then you tie about, well, how do, how do you benefit from that? Or how do you contribute to that GSP resource or experience? Um, and I think that's really, honestly, the most strategic way to do it. It'll become more memorable. So for example, let's just say you were a private equity person or you want to go into private equity, right? And you said, okay, Stanford is the ideal fit for someone such as myself who's looking to become a private equity professional in the impact space. Um, you know, for example, the classes on so and so are really geared for my or good will complement my background as I have spent a lot of time in the industrial sector. But if I want to go into impact, this class would be real. These classes are unique and would really be a great way for me to complement my hard skills with um, with with the, or my skills in one sector with the skills or knowledge in another. Um, secondly, you know, the research, the network here, again, I'm making this up, but the network here would be um, exceptional because. Uh, there are a ton of people who go into private equity, but even more specifically, there are groups um, tied towards impact PE where I can I can engage in and actually bring in speakers or, or bring in alumni who are part of this cohort of very dedicated but very specialized people. Um, and then a third, you know, and so forth. You get the idea, right? So you see how I have brought myself into this. I have made it very specific, but I have layered on GSB and the interviewer will then in response, hopefully say, hey, this person has a very clear understanding of GSB and how they would have uh, a strong impact and experience if they were accepted and attended. Okay, this person asks, I never worked in corporate. My work experience is either self-owned business and family business. Do Stanford, does Stanford consider these kinds of candidates or are they picky for candidates from the corporate world? Nope, they consider them all. Um, the uh, there just tend to be a lot more people from the corporate world, as however you want to define that, who are getting MBAs because uh, it, it is a natural part of the progression. There's a culture of it um, and so forth. And so that's why you might be slightly overrepresented. Um, and a lot of times people who are in cell phone, their family businesses, oftentimes don't necessarily need the MBA to keep doing what it is they're doing. So that is part of the reason as to why you, you have a, a proportion as such. Uh, but no, they'll absolutely consider you. I mean, I went to, to a competing business school, but there are plenty of, of, of family owned businesses or people coming from family owned businesses. They were exceptional people. Um, it has nothing to do with your credentials, but the onus does fall on you to 
to uh, explain how your experience stacks up with people who are coming from very different uh, worlds compared to your own um, and why you think you can hold your own in the GSB uh, experience. And then, and certainly as it relates to the interview, you want to be able to pull on experiences and things like that, that demonstrate your leadership potential, that demonstrate your academic prowess, you know, and other things such as that, that another candidate in, say, a consulting firm or military might have to answer as well in their own context. What is the minimum GMAT score for Stanford? There is no minimum, but um, you can look online and see that they're, what their median and mean is and what the 80% range is, and that should give you a very good feel of whether um, you think you would fit. My general suggestion is if you're coming from, and you hear this all, people hear this all the time, if you're coming from a competitive demographic, um, whether that's, um, uh, you know, uh, or, or a, a competitive industry, you probably want to score slightly above that or at least at or near it um, so that give yourself a chance because the argument is that, you know, the schools have their pick of the litter. So you don't want to have a component, um, especially something as objective as the GMAT working against you. Um, but but generally speaking, <laughs> trying to give you an answer to this question, you really don't want to have anything less than a 700. I'm not saying that people with 690 or 680 or even lower than that are not considered. But with around a 730, um, I think it's 730 uh, average or median GMAT, um, you can't fall too far below that. Scores have been bumping up and up. Um, and so 700 would be sort of my practical uh, minimum, but really a 730 is kind of the safe space. Again, every situation is slightly, every situation, every candidate is slightly different. What should one do if his GPA is below the school average? Well, there's nothing you can do, right? That, that cake is already baked. But what you can do to potentially mitigate some of that is to do very well on the GMAT. So kind of following on my previous point, try and do even better than the average. Let's just say you had a below average GPA as you want to define it. Um, you know, maybe you need to do a 750 on the GMAT uh, to balance it out because what GPA indicates for the schools or specifically Stanford or is is an ability to do well academically. Can you, again, hold your own in the classes that um, in which you'll be in with fairly competitive other high and other high achieving students? Um, the one thing I will say, though, is that GPA is ac even though it's numerical. Uh, statistic, it is a little bit subjective because it does range from country to country, from uh, school to school, from or university to university, school within the university to school within the university to the major of the courses you pick. So you can see there are a lot of different layers um, that factor in. So, for example, an engineering student at MIT, which is known to have a harder curve, might have a, a, a lower GPA than someone who did a lesser um, less com less technical or competitive major in a different type of school. Um, and so the GPAs will look very different, even if, say, the MIT student is academically more gifted. Again, making that up, don't MIT people don't hold it against me. <laughs> um, but the point is, is that, uh, you know, you want to, it, it, it is more subjective than, than people think. So while you don't want to have a GPA that's well out of the range of, of, of these schools, I think you do need to take that into account alongside uh, GMAT. And if there was a extenuating circumstances or specific reason why your GPA is far below, it could be personal in nature or something like that, there is the option to talk about that in the optional essays. Um, and you can just briefly state what that reason is and why you think that is not necessarily a great indication of your potential. Question is, do interviewers make decisions as soon as the interview is over, or do they go back to the application and review it holistically? So the inter for the most part, as I mentioned, these are alumni and these are blind interviews. So they're not actually reviewing the applications. They're effectively conducting the interview, doing their write-up, and then sending that through whatever system GSB has to the admissions committee, who in turn um, reviews that as part of the holistic evaluation. The nuance of the question is, the interviewer will likely make a decision on how they felt the interview went in that moment or shortly thereafter. It's very hard to form a very different impression of someone 12 hours after the interview compared to, say, within the hour. Um, that's just human nature, unless 
they were trying to stack it up against the, a variety of candidates that they interview, assuming they do that. Um, so, so you know, you obviously want to do well, and that again, you want to get your thank you note out to kind of close that loop. Um, but that that component of your application is effectively done. But I think the question implies that the interviewers are actually doing the application evaluation, which unless they're an admissions committee member, is not the case. The question is how um, how is someone like me who is working as a government officer as a civil engineer fit into the GSB profile? I mean, you would be a candidate. I mean, everyone is a candidate. There are very few people who are not candidates. I can't really answer the question entirely just based on the little information I have here. And there is no again ideal GSB profile. It's all about how you how you uh, communicate your profile and how you you put your narrative together. Based on what you're telling me, that could be a fit. It could also be very standard. There's not, I'm not, wouldn't say there's anything that's not a fit. The only thing that isn't is someone, for example, who has like one year of work experiences applying for the full time MBA program. That's typically not in the profile, or someone who has like 15 years of experience. That is probably beyond um, what they're looking for. Uh, b bearing in mind, by the way, I'm the, the former example, they do have uh, Stanford, a lot of these top schools has have the. Um, the deferred MBA program, so they do look at younger candidates through a different process. Um, but the point is, is that as long as you check many of the boxes in terms of the overall GPA, the GMAT, and and the general criteria like having um, a bachelor's degree from an accredited university, everything else is fair game. Stanford will never answer this question and say you're not a fit. They're going to say apply, see how you advertise yourself, and see where it fits in. Sometimes you have very unusual candidates who come from the most unique backgrounds. Then you have other people who are very standard. Who you know there are 15, 20 candidates who fit that same profile, come from the same companies year over year. So there's a wide range, and I wouldn't ever rule yourself out based on a biographical profile. The question is, are letters of support from alumni recommended for GSB applicants? What are, where are these letters, where are these letters supposed to be sent? Okay, so the answer to, it's a mixed answer. So there isn't, alumni who are writing letters of recommendation through the regular process is in the two, I think it's the two applicants or application or reference letters that are allowed um, as part of the normal process. It doesn't make any difference who they are. Um, they should ideally, as is often talked about, be a supervisor or a manager, but there can be conflicts of interest with that. If they, if the recommender happens to be an alumnus of GSB, great. I think where that comes into play is that they can speak adequately to how you might fit into the GSB experience and how you've demonstrated uh, skills and experiences and personality that, um, that, that fits that narrative. But it's not like the schools are going to say, well, this letter was written by an alumnus and therefore it should carry more weight than a letter that was for another candidate that was written by someone from another school or no MBA for that matter. It doesn't work that way. If Where the alumni letters could help is if the candidate is waitlisted and the candidate then seeks a letter from an alumnus who obviously was an initial recommender uh, who might then say, OK, this is how uh, this is i support this candidate and so forth and even putting one more layer on top of that for it to really matter frankly it has to be an alumnus with some influence not just someone who graduated necessarily a year after <laughs> this process is or you know who's a recent alumnus but someone who has some sort of clout otherwise it's just another letter of support these processes are very competitive and there really isn't and you can kind of hopefully see the the, the consistency in my advice here, there really isn't a, a, in a way to gain this. Um, again, unless you know someone incredibly influential, which in that case, you probably would have leveraged them earlier in the process anyways. Okay, this question is, does it, um, I guess it's, the, I'm going to rephrase here, but does it look bad if I change from uh, corporate to tech startup and then back to corporate. No, I mean, I, I don't know the details of this type of move or what you're considering. So I'll take it with a, at a high level here. But look, everyone makes different sorts of career moves. There's no bad, right? It might make the story a little more complicated in that you have to explain. You're basically saying you're making 
two transitions, three jobs before you apply, that can be complicated in its own right. But as long as you kind of have a narrative and explain why it is you went from A to B to A or A to B to C, depending on how you define it, um, that's fine. It, it, maybe you learn, hey, the tech startup was a great different experience that I reintroduced to corporate. Um, there, there are a lot of different ways you can tell your story. And, and maybe this is even better. Maybe it's more interesting to kind of be like, hey, I went a, a route less traveled. Uh, than, than other people who went from corporate to say startups. I mean, again, I don't know all the details of this type of move, um, but it, it, on the whole, it does not look bad. It's just a question of did you, how quickly did you move and why did you move and can you explain it adequately? Great. Okay, so th that seems like those are all of the questions. Um, I'll wait another five seconds if anyone has anything else. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. So this has been incredible. I hope this has been incredibly helpful for all of you. Um, as I mentioned, I am Seth Shapiro. I am from Admission Auto. Um, if you'd like to work with our company, our website is admissionauto.com. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we have a link towards free consultations, usually in the top right corner. Um, fill that out if you're interested in soliciting our services or at least learning more. Um, the free consultation is a great way to uh, talk to a, a consultant with whom you might work, get to know their personality, their experiences, our services, what makes the most sense for what you want out of this, your budget and so forth, and hopefully get you set up um, uh, you know, with a nice package. Uh, we, you may also go to gmatclub.com and look at um, our, our thread where we'll do, we do profile evaluations, we give advice, um, we obviously direct you back to our company, but um, but but that's you know a nice way to engage with us as well if you don't necessarily want to go the free consultation route or considering it. Uh, but you know, good luck to everyone in this process. It's right now we're obviously finishing up um, uh, the 2021 2022 season. Um, but for anyone who is uh, interested or thinking about applying for round one or round two of this year, I strongly urge you to get a head start. These processes take a long time. Um, they're very, they're much more detailed than than people think, um, and it's always best to have time on your side. Um, so reach out if we can do anything, and if not, best of luck to everyone applying and in all future endeavors. Have a good one.